Welcome to Wireless Future. I'm Emil Björnsson, and as always, I have Eric Larsson on the line. How are you today? Oh, hello, Emil. I'm fine. How are you? I'm great. Uh, Happy New Year, by the way. Oh, Happy New Year. So uh, it's great to start this year off with another episode of the podcast. And I think it's uh, today's episode 24. Is that is that right, Emil? Yeah, that's right. And uh, I had a brief opportunity last year to, to travel and go to a conference. And then I met some of the listeners, uh, which is a great opportunity to get. Unfortunately, uh, it seems for the moment that we'll be taking some time before we, we really have physical uh, conferences again. But... For this episode, we have at least to gather some questions that we have received from our listeners. So we were planning to, to answer them. So it's uh, great to actually get this feedback from everyone who is actually out there and listening. Mm-hmm. Yes, much appreciated. I mean, thanks to the audience for all the feedback and, and questions that we've been receiving. And uh, I think today during the Q&A, we'll be able to address a subset of the questions yeah. that we have received. So. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so we have selected 10 questions. We might have reformulated slightly the, the questions, but I believe the people who ask them will actually recognize uh, precisely the question. So I hope people will be satisfied with our answers. Absolutely. So, so you want to kick me off, Emil? Yeah. Uh, Would you yeah. like to, <laughs> to ask me the, the first question, by the way? Absolutely. So I'll, um, the, the first question relates to... Um, um, let's say uh, technological uh, lo- loss of uh, <laughs> our laws are how technology seemed to, to evolve or has evolved in the past, right? So there's first is Moore's law that states that the numbers of transistors that you can squeeze into to, to a circuit doubles mm. every every other year or every two years. And then there's Edholm's law that states that the data rates in the uh, different categories of telecommunications, there is wireless and wired and nomadic, that is doubles every 18 months. Hmm. And the question is now, what is our prediction? I mean, do these laws, to start with, do they hold? And to, at what point will they be broken? And which one of them will be broken first? So do you, Emil, want to have a go wow. on this one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's a complicated question, of course, to, to predict. So both of these laws are uh, sort of empirical. People are looking at data of how the transistors are increasing uh, in numbers per square uh, unit uh, of space or when uh, the data traffic is increasing, how quickly is it doing? And then they try to make predictions. And I think it's fair to say that we have seen an exponential increase, which means sort of a percentage increase every year that is stable. But exactly what percentage that is, is to some extent the question here. So I think uh, Phil Edholm at uh, Nortel, who was uh, giving the name to this Edholm law, I think originally he was saying that uh, or noticing that we see this traffic uh, increase or the peak rates are increasing in all different types of technologies in an exponential pace. And then people started to look at that data. I'm not sure if he did it himself or not. And were then finding this doubling every 18 months. And doubling every 18 months, that's like 60% per year. Uh, So I tried to to look at the data and see if that still is holding up. And, And if you look at the mobile data traffic, for example, in 4G and 5G networks, then uh, in the beginning of the 4G era, we were even seeing a doubling every year, so, which is more than than this law. And I think that was also where people started to talk about that, oh, 5G needs to be a thousand times more traffic than 4G because of the doubling every year that turns into that over 10 years' time. But then if you look at the data, the growth rate is um, becoming slower. I think uh, it it was the 60% for a few years ago. And then nowadays it's more predicted to be 25 to 35%. And it's increasing faster in the developing part of the world, naturally. So I, I think that in the mobile telecom, uh, this was really, oh, now we are switching to using our mobile phones for internet connections. And then that is increasing quickly and then it converts to something. Uh, and what will it converge to? Well, if you look at Cisco data for things uh, for internet traffic in general, it seems to be rather stable now around 25, maybe 30% increase per year. 
So I think that is what we are really converging to, that people are not caring about if they use fixed internet or, or the mobile phones. And then, uh, yeah, the general traffic growth of the internet will then be the one used in, in all of these things. So, so there, I think my, my conclusion is really that the law, the Edholm law have already dead and <laughs> died a few years ago, perhaps. <laughs> It, it, then there is, by the way, also the Cooper's Law. And Martin Cooper from Motorola who was noticing in, in the 90s that he was claiming a doubling in wireless traffic every two and a half year, which is like 30%. And we are closer to that, I believe. So so maybe that law isn't mm. dead yet. Mm. Of course, I mean, it's hard to make predictions about sort of things for the future, right? Uh, mm. uh, I mean, so my understanding is that it took longer than what the industry thought for mobile broadband to take off. But once it took off, it really took off, right? And we, we don't know about the future. I mean, for certain mobile broadband is there is one of the main applications. But we'll also be seeing like all these machine to machine and AI and machine learning applications that would require like vast amounts of data transfer and that might not have taken off yet. And we don't really know when it will. I mean, it, it's almost certain that at some point it will, but uh, when it yeah. will happen and how fast it will happen will it like double every year or quadruple or tenfold or some other or some percentage it's like almost impossible I think to predict so yeah. that's like my view on, <laughs> on the question <laughs> yeah and we we were discussing this slightly with uh, Magnus Frodig from Ericsson last year and I think his point of view was that we might be in a transition phase now when we are waiting for the next big thing which might be VR or applications and then the traffic might once again go up to, to these numbers so, so I think the future will, will, will tell there mm. So how about the Moore's law then? Mm -hmm. The question here related to Edholm's law and Moore's law and to what extent they're like compatible, I suppose. (laughs) Yeah, so I think (laughs) Gordon Moore was already in 65 or something like that. He he was uh, uh, noticing these things. And then it has been sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy that uh, we should make sure that we can double the number of transistors per unit area in the ships every two years and i think nowadays you can find a number of different uh, news articles claiming that morse law is dead Uh, but i think it really boils down to how do we really define these things because if it's about that we we're only caring about that we should double the number of transistors. Then, yeah, we are approaching the end of the, that development if we haven't already done it. Because, yeah, when it's only a few atoms uh, sized um, <laughs> uh, transistors, you can't sh- shrink it more, right? Uh, yeah, but no, there's it, an absolute limit at some point, yeah, obviously. Exactly. Uh, but, but if you rather is interpreting it as can we continue doubling the uh, performance of ships? Uh, every two years uh, when the ship is of the same size. There, uh, we have actually seen good improvements in recent years with system over ship kind of things. So even if the, we are not shrinking the size of transistors, the still the efficiency of the implementations is still following this trend. Mm. So, and it's not only yeah. a matter of like densifying and packing more transistors, tra- transistors onto the chip, right? It's also a matter of like, implementing large-scale DVF uh, dynamic voltage and frequency scaling technology, for example, mm. so that within the same chip you can have different zones where you that you control the speed of independently and therefore the, the power consumption and so forth. Um, so I, I think that DVFS technology and also massive parallelism in how you do computations and how you deploy, like well, in, a, in, a, in like a mobile device, you might just have a single chip, but in data centers you have many of them, right? And then it becomes a matter of how do you distribute the computations across these um, uh, circuits um, in order to minimize like power consumption. So so it's not only the density of the integration on a piece of silicon that matters here in the end. Yeah, no, so uh, if I should wrap up my my long answer here, I would say that uh, it's debatable now if Moore's law is starting to die or, or not, if we should just reinterpret how it is. So, so that one still seems to be, be living, while the Edholm's law, I personally think that it uh, died a few years ago. 
and maybe we should uh, view more Cooper's Law as the, the living version there. Yeah, and let's remember, I mean, fitting and extrapolating exponential functions is very difficult and dangerous. Yes. So. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think for the time being, we will at least see exponential increases in both of these cases. And what the exact pace is, is a different thing. Maybe it's just switching the, the growth rate, but it's still yeah. exponential. Mm. Okay, should we take a second question? Absolutely. So I have a question for you then. As more antennas, wider bandwidth and higher frequency are utilized, it's seen that communication and sensing will be integrated. What's your opinion on this area? What problems are worth tackling in the next few years? Mm. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, to start with, obviously, RF signals can be used for communications, right? And they can be, mm. be used for sensing, which both are like established technologies. I mean, s- sensing means radar essentially, right? And and uh, communications is what we what we have <laughs> in, in the mobile systems. Um, so now speaking of integrated communication and sensing, I think there are a few different things that people refer to. Um, one is that we could use equipment nominally designed for communications to also do sensing. For example, a Wi-Fi access point could sense the environment, check essentially whether the channel impulse response varies over time or has changed in a certain way and, and draw conclusions then on what's going on in the in the room where it's de- deployed. Um, that's already a technology using Wi-Fi for sensing, right? I mean, there, there are methods mm. you can use to detect whether someone has fallen on the floor or how many people are moving in the room and so forth. I think it's a, it's a greatly exciting and, and potentially highly useful um, uh, technolo- technology indeed. And I also think that scaling that up, I mean, now using like massive MIMO arrays to do the sensing. Well, <laughs> with, with a single antenna, we have a lot of data, right? Over 20 megahertz bandwidth, you have like <laughs> 20 million samples a second you can play with. And now if you have on top of that, or in addition to that, if you have 100 antennas, you have like 100 times more baseband data, which gives you, in addition to, to temporal and frequency resolution, also gives you spatial resolution. So I think there are great opportunities there for, for both for new algorithm development and also for development of new applications. Uh, now, speaking of integrated sensing and communications, one could think of, of course, using communication signals for the sensing, like getting the sensing result as a byproduct of the communications, rather than sending a signal that's tailored for the sensing uh, um, yeah. Particularly, I mean, a radar signal. Essentially, you could you could send a, com- a data packet and then use that waveform for sensing. Certainly, I mean, if 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 bandwidth scarcity is an issue, I can see that that could be useful. Definitely, I mean, you could get the, the sensing result for free as a byproduct or as a bonus of your communications link. Um, so, so absolutely, I think it's an exciting area with very good prospect for, for new algorithms, new applications and, and, and useful applications. Um, another aspect of the, this is the question I think relates to radar systems. And a, a good example, I think, is radars on board vehicles. Because mm-hmm. I've heard a case being made that I mean, we have very, for, for communications, we have very good standards, right? Ways of getting along and like how to license, buy pieces of a spectrum and, and get exclusive license to use that piece. And then how to get along within an unlicensed spectrum, for example, like with Wi-Fi and so forth. But I've heard a case being made that for, for radars on board vehicles, there aren't like any good standards for how a radar on a Mercedes should coexist with a radar on a Toyota or, or, or some other car. And yeah. Um, then it's very possible that the, the the automotive industry here could 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 borrow or be inspired or rely on the the uh, telecommunications industry and the the efforts and the say wisdom and experience learned there in the standardization in order to develop ways that radar systems could coexist in in the same spectrum because at some point if we start deploying like well r- radars on every vehicle and maybe other types of radar sensors out there they they would have to get along <laughs> in the same piece of spectrum right um, and certainly w- one could think of like again they're starting off from the radar and then using the radar signals also for communications so again I think 
integrating sensor sensing and, and communications and using the same signals for both purposes would be meaningful mostly if we really have a shortage of, of spectrum so that we can't afford like sending a separate probing signal for the radar and then sending a communication signal for the data transfer. Um, hmm. So certainly I think it's an exciting, uh, let's say, research field with many potential useful applications for the future. Yeah, no, that, that is my impression as well, that this is uh, really one of the, the interesting topics to explore more now when we people are talking about 6G. What kind of things would we have to bring with us when standardizing that type of technology in order for it, making sure that it actually works out well? Uh, because I think the hope is sort of that we should be able to then use all the base stations that will anyway be deployed for these purposes. So if they are prepared there then mm. yeah uh, as you yeah, were I mean the, the mm. hardware the equipment is already there right so think of it yeah. if you have a as a possible maybe uh, futuristic application but if you have a macro cell massive MIMO base station up there with hundreds of antennas that are used for all this multiplexing of traffic and all that and then you could this is a bonus use this base station to recognize activity that's going on in the area or, or counter traffic on the highway or something I mean that would be um, it's just an exciting prospect indeed. Yeah, yeah. so, so I think uh, f- for people who have some previous expertise in in MIMO or in localization or millimeter wave areas, I think this is a good future research topic to work within where you sort of build on your knowledge you already have, but also do something new that haven't been explored as much. It should be. Absolutely, it should be. Yeah, yeah um, so third question that we've received um, if you Emil want to have a go at that and hmm? it relates to 5G networks and specifically private and local 5G networks and where we stand with that and how soon that we are going to see these private and local 5G networks being deployed on a larger scale yeah this is a good question so I think this is to a large extent not a technology question anymore there are hardware that you can utilize for for 5g obviously uh, but more of a uh, regulatory aspect Uh, but uh, in sweden for example like a month ago uh, there were a decision from our regulatory body saying that now people can apply for uh, local licenses Uh, you can get like up to 40 megahertz in the 3.8 gigahertz band you can get uh, see uh, there's like 850 megahertz in the 25 gigahertz band uh, i guess one can get 400 out of those per per, uh, per building uh, so um yeah building owners can apply for this now and it seems like the the spectrum are, are very affordable for a few hundred dollars you will get a license for for most of, of the spectrum there so uh, i think then the so main question yeah. dollars um, per uh, hertz i suppose uh, uh, no the, i think the, the it, price it was range here. <laughs> uh, i think the price range was a bit like uh, 50 dollars for 10 megahertz in the uh, hmm. three gigahertz oh, band there yeah. and then it was half of that price for i don't remember exactly the, the numbers there but the, it was cheaper in the millimeter wave where there's also mm. more spectrum yeah but i, I suppose it's depend on how large geographical area that you that yeah you wanna, so uh, this was uh, uh, it's, it's was like, like a, one building oh one building okay yeah so it's not so like it's, so it's per building it's not like per square yeah. kilometer or something so. Mm. no so, so in, in sweden this was connected to a building so sort of in your application you need to mention with building uh, it mm. is uh, so uh, I think we will t- then see next year th- these kind of deployments. Then yeah. I think many are pondering on what will you use it for. I was talking mm. for uh, people at a premium hotel chain in Sweden that seemed to be interested in uh, in trying it out. So what would be the benefits compared to Wi-Fi? Well, yeah, uh, yeah, you you can probably have more predictable latency, more uh, controllable data rates, and things like that. People mm-hmm. will not destroy it with uh, putting up a Wi-Fi network in the room but uh, yeah in which situation do you really want to pay for this i think the future will mm. will tell yeah i mean in the end wi-fi works pretty well right properly mm. deployed and installed it's pretty good solution indoors 
So yeah, uh, but 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 it, so these licenses. I mean, how do you actually buy them? So are they like at fixed price? So you go to Media Markt and buy like a gift card, fifty dollars <laughs> of Spectrum for Christmas. <laughs> so in in Sweden, you you fill in a form and submit it to oh. the uh, regulatory body here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I'm sh- sure it can be different different countries. And also in Sweden, it's not all part of Sweden where you are allowed to, to get it right now. Some municipalities have uh, dropped out. Some mm. have sensitive equipment. They don't want people to go out and deploy things themselves. Mm. Wow. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, I believe that the most important thing might be factories or, or mines or construction sites and these type of right, right. things where, where you Hopefully, we'll have robots that should be connected and maybe use 5G for that. Mm, mm, right. We really need to or, or want to make sure that there is no interference from anyone. I mean, you're the only one who are allowed mm. to transmit actually in that spectrum that you bought. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I have another question for you. Uh, one of the claimed key candidate technologies for 6G is. Uh, RAS or reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. Do you think RAS will be a key enabler of 6G? Uh, and the question is also adding here two key motivations behind RAS is low cost and energy. Until now, are these claims justified or, or not? Mm. Yeah, good question. I mean, so first, is it RAS or RIS or RIS or how do I actually say this? Some people say IRS, I think, but RIS yeah. or RIS seems to be to be more common. Um, yeah, I think we are converging <laughs> towards uh, that name. Uh, yeah. yeah. And it was a bit like Massive Mimo also had many names in the beginning and uh, then people converge towards that name. Yeah, right. So maybe we'll just say RIS then mm-hmm. <laughs> for a discussion here. Um, yeah, I think you can get different answers depending on whom you ask here. And my stand is that I'm rather hesitant to risk being, uh, well, even a key technology in 6G, let mm. alone having much of actual real commercial potential on a large scale. So, I mean, let's see if we can still mend the argument for why risk would be a key technology in 6G, right? So there is this... Um, case being made that risk could be used to improve coverage, which mm-hmm. I think is factually correct. I mean, it's certainly and it'd certainly be a lot of fun to participate in like building prototypes and, and, and testing this technology. And I, I'm, I'm not denying the fact that there are also like bottomless <laughs> with, with research problems, right? That one can and have and people have been written a lot of papers indeed. <laughs> it's a very popular like research topic in academia. But mm. so, so now this argument that you could, it could be used to improve coverage. I mean, for example, you could like put up somewhere in, in your home, you could put on the wall something that looks like a painting, but it's actually a, a reflecting in, intelligent surface. And it would have to, to start with to be quite large to to, to provide any gain, right? And it would have to be powered in some way. So you need either a battery or you'd need you'd need a connector to, to, to power outlet. And then uh, I don't think it's feasible really technically to make risks out of energy harvesting technology. So you would have to power it somehow. And once you power it, then I, you know, I feel like, okay, so now you put this up and it, you know, you, you gotta make an effort to that it's not ugly, right? I mean, it has to look like a piece of art or something. Otherwise there's just no way I would put it up there. and then um, if you do this, it'll take up a lot of space. I mean, and the, the same space, and given that you anyway you need to put connected to, to, to the grid through a power outlet, then why not put a small access point there? I mean, small Wi-Fi access point, a small repeater, or, or one of these is TP-Link, or what's the brand name for this, Wi-Fi repeaters, and, um, you know, or, or even a small MIMO, like array or something, right? And, and outdoors, I mean, you could you could certainly think of, like, you know, in a mega city, right, with skyscrapers to, to cover the facade of the skyscraper with with a wrist that would be many square meters large. Then it's kind of a fascinating prospect to do it. But again, I mean, my impression has been that even just the installation costs and the site costs for, for conventional base station and access points is just humongous, right? And then now saying we put in a wrist up there, which is tens of square meters large, then 
well, powering it might not be a big deal, but actually installing it and like, well, maybe it'll be beautiful. Mm. Maybe it'll look like some golden kind of decoration or maybe it could be integrated <laughs> into some kind of neon light flashing, you know, <laughs> add billboards or who knows. Um, but I still find it like hard to make the case. Besides, my understanding is that in, in, in big cities, I mean, we have a capacity problem, right? And then if we have a capacity problem, then it, certainly we could have a coverage problem also. But we do have a capacity problem. That's why massive MIMO at lower bands already has succeeded commercially in, in deployments in big cities. And then given that, why don't you just install another massive MIMO base station there? I mean, you know, I, I think we share this vision, you and me, Emil, that the way massive MIMO base station should look like, right? Like like a big flat screen TV, more or less. And, you know, you could make it very large. You could distribute the antennas over the facade of this building. And I think we, we discussed that didn't we talk about that in some previous episode of the yeah. podcast? Or if not, we should. I mean, at some point in the future. But the, the idea of building like a distributed massive MIMO array, which is many square meters large and could cover, you know, the, the facade of a skyscraper. So um, I think my stand on... So the question was whether this is a key technology in 6G. Well, certainly it's, it's kind of fascinating technology, right? And... Uh, it's just maybe my personal take on it is I'm ambivalent and I have a bit hard to see that there would be major commercial use cases for it. I can see that using this sort of technology or rather meta surface technology to build MIMO transmitters could be meaningful at yeah. very high carry frequencies, especially. So rather than building a coherent MIMO array, you have like a single antenna transmitter and then you have this reflecting meta surface nearby that you, you use to control how the beam is, is shaped right but that's that's a little different yeah there there is already commercial hardware yeah and 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 that i that i fully support that, that, I mean, that's more like a way of building a um, a, a beam steering was well, not really mimo right it's like one of a face array kind of beam steering mm. transmitters so certainly but but there is for for coverage and capacity enhancement um so again, I mean, it's hard to predict the future. I might be wrong, but <laughs> my assessment, let's say, of the situation is that it's hard to find like a clear case that this really be commercially vi- even viable on large scale in the future. What do you think, Emil? Yeah, so I think that the... Uh I mean, the lowest hanging fruit that we would be able to use something like this for is to uh, try to remove some coverage holes where it feels unnecessary to put up new base stations just for that purpose. But then a coverage hole is typically a fixed location, an area. Uh, So the reconfigurability might not really be be neither there. Maybe we we could put up some uh, clever surfaces that are not reconfigured and always reflect the signals uh, around the corner or into a particular coverage hole. So I think I've heard telecom operators showing interest in those use cases, but whether we needed real-time reconfigurable and therefore having an energy consumption, mm. I, I don't know. It's really yeah, it's configurability. It's actually, mm. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you got to separate, on one hand, the reflecting surface kind of technology, and on the other hand, the, or, or, uh, the, the whether the surface is intelligent and can adapt instantaneously, right? So, mm. yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, Great. So maybe we should move on here through the mm-hmm. list of questions. And if you want to go on the next one. So the next one is on uh, large apertures mm-hmm. in massive MIMO and specifically how to use optimal precoding and combining methods to eliminate interference uh, when the dimensions of the channel matrix increases, you know, whether we can manage the complexity of the processing. So I guess this refers to like mm-hmm. build larger and larger antenna arrays may be distributed even right with my mode and at some point you will run into a computational problem because of just the sheer amount of basement data and samples that have to be processed Hmm. yes so uh, if we go back to the initial works by thomas etta for massive mime kind of of research which was uh, really about really large apertures going to the infinity or something like that then he was advocating a lot for using the simplest kind of processing like maximum ratio 
processing where you you don't need to invert any matrices or anything you don't actively try to get rid of interference by processing your your data signal you just see that well we have so many uh, channel dimensions so that the users will automatically become distinguishable so if we build these large surfaces we could hope for doing that if uh, and uh, we have probably seen with the size that arrays that we have today that uh, we can get big gains by using MMSC zero forcing kind of processing method and it's feasible to implement but if the complexity of doing something like that is growing linearly with the number of antennas and uh, quadratically with the number of users then eventually it, it might be too heavy so so what do we do i think that is really what it boils down to mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I think uh, one can look for something in between, uh, just ignoring interference with maximum ratio and hope that the channel is automatically taking care of it, or doing full-blown MMC. So, so we had some work that we called polynomial expansion precoding, where we took the, the matrix inverse, we expanded it as a polynomial with a few terms, it's like a Taylor approximation of an inverse, and then uh, we apply that. It doesn't necessarily reduce the number of operations that much, but it gets rid of an inverse, which it might be easier to implement. Uh, but I think what really what one should do to make this uh, work well is to to take your all of your dimensions you're having, trying to to spatially filter the signal somehow. From what dimensions do we get signal? From which one do we not? Try to figure out in which dimensions are there multiple signals from different users. Uh, and uh, apply some kind of interference, uh, yeah, interference suppression in those dimensions, not in the other one. So be a bit more clever uh, using some kind of hierarchical uh, implementations of interference mitigation. Mm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, and again, there are great opportunities, I think, for further algorithm development in, in that regard. So it's, yeah. it's a good uh, question. Yeah. And I think when we were briefly talking about this near and far field kind of things, we were also mentioning that some of the, the peop things that people are analyzing is just for an array of a certain geometry, uh, what is a set of beams going in different directions? What are the uh, dimensions? Uh, for a uniform linear array, we have this discrete Fourier transform that happens to point out uh, signals going in a orthogonal uh, set of directions. And can we, for other type of arrays, figure that out from the beginning? Because then we know what spatial filtering will be. We should go through those different dimensions and we, we, then we don't need to like compute eigenvalue decompositions that would be super complicated to figure out where the signal is. We, we can just filter in different ways. Okay, I have a question for you, uh, and it's about machine learning. Uh, do you think it can be a game changer in the coming year for uh, 6G development? Uh, and the person is adding, I've heard people work in the industry saying that this is just a matter of citations that people are considering <laughs> because machine learning is not used for industrial research and development. <laughs> Yeah, so okay. Um, so whether machine learning can be a game changer for 6G. So let me first say that I'm enormously fascinated and impressed by modern machine learning algorithms and what they can do. I mean, particularly in, in you know, computer vision, right? I mean, recognizing objects and videos and images and in natural language processing and so forth. It's just amazing, I think, this development we've seen over the last, is it like maybe 10 years, I think it's... Um, this, this really happened um, and continues to happen, by the way. I mean, it's just highly fascinating. Now, for 6G, I mean, certainly, I mean, machine learning, which means a lot of things, right? I mean, a lot of people associate, as it seems, machine, machine learning with only convolutional neural networks or, or, or deep learning and so forth. But it's, not, it's not really accurate. I mean, machine learning is a lot of things, right? Some of which have been around for a very long time, like even just fitting a nonlinear function or, or, or spline or to, to data points is, is in a way it's machine learning right like reg regression problems and certainly machine learning is an important tool in the toolbox no question and, and there are, are cases where it's extremely powerful to use in in let's say in, in com theory applications where I think we discussed this in a previous episode right when we don't have maybe accurate physical models and you know model something like user mobility or something and you might not start model. You might not use, or 
if you attempt to model user mobility, you might not start off with Newton mechanics and kind of like <laughs> where human <laughs> looks like this, right? You have a head and you have a body and so forth. I'm not saying it's completely infeasible, but it, but it seems like a, a use case where, you know, this postulating some, well, model that you can train with a neural network seems like a, a very useful approach and I, indeed i think it is now whether it's a game changer probably not i mean in the end i mean wireless comms is limited by by physics right in the end it's like well speed of light limits the coherence of the channel which limits how fast we can we can obtain channel state information and, and how many you know users we can multiplex with a mimo array and so forth so I, I think probably not the game changer, uh, but definitely a useful tool in the toolbox. Hmm. And then there is also, I think, another aspect that deserves to be mentioned here, namely that, so there is this argument that there is now hardware becoming available off the shelf that can implement certain machine learning or air quotes machine learning algorithms <laughs> neural networks in particular right and we have all mm. these gpus and that that like family of hardware and therefore given that we have this hardware available off the shelf then that it would be meaningful to abandon like classical algorithms and rather use algorithms that can run efficiently on, on this particular hardware pl platforms well I can certainly see that if you if you if you work for a company that manufactures this sort of hardware you, they, they want to make the case for that but you know in the end I think we have to be more visionary here too right um, I think there's no question that a, a, a an ASIC designed for for a specific task is always going to be more or let's say well-designed ASIC where an ASIC well designed for a specific task is always going to be more um, efficient than any available off the shelf hardware platform. And, and, and today it's very difficult and, and expensive to develop ASICs, right? I mean, you put in like thousands of, of man hours and then manufacturing, you need like produce many of them for the, even for the initial costs to set up costs in, in the manufacturing process to pay off. But I'm not sure that's, there is anything fundamentally that, I mean, means that this has to be that way, right? I mean, if we think of a future, you know, 25 years down the road, who said, who, who says that, or, or what says that we could not have, we could not do rapid prototyping with ASICs? Like, you know, you, you have your simulation code in Python or C++ or some language in your PC, and you just hit enter, and then you wait overnight or you know doesn't really matter i mean how <laughs> but it could be some ai algorithm in in the back end that does the job and translates your code into highly efficient vhdl and then you hit enter again and you know it's sent off for a manufacturer and you get your chip back in in in, in a few days um just like the development in in um, metal and, and plastic manufacture right with i mean to to build like prototype of a piece of plastics used to be that you have to either use milling or you have to build a mold and then you have to like mold the plastics but now with 3d printing technology you can you can do it in in, in your basement <laughs> directly from the cad software and we are not there yet obviously with hardware and asics right but it's not clear to me that we could couldn't be heading there and i think that's another potential development that we ought to talk about that would also be very mm. exciting and so anyway that was like um the comments maybe tangential to the um, to the to the actual question here but i felt it was worth making so what do you and think I th emil <laughs> i think the question is also a bit negative in the tone i think that the industry are using machine learning but uh, then actually throwing out existing algorithms and replace them entirely with machine learning that might be far-fetched but if you can tune some parameters which people did manually before and now you use machine learning well then you if you get five percent improvement in every part of the protocol that you're having then maybe that adds up to something large in the end uh, and that is how we should view mm. the improvements so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and as you said, I mean, we are already, and we have been also, depending on how you define machine learning, we've been using it for a very long time, right? So, mm. uh, so it's there, and it's it's a highly useful and important tool in the toolbox. 
um, whether it's a game changer for 6G, it's a different different story. Mm. So yeah, you have a question for me? I do, in, indeed. <laughs> so I think we're at number seven in the list here, and the next one is on dynamic spectrum sharing and what ro- what role could that play in in 5G as opposed to maybe question should be like 5G and beyond or even 6G, right? So, so uh, uh, dynamic spectrum sharing could mean that many different things, generally speaking, but in 5G, I think it have a particular meaning. So there are products now from the big vendors that are, are doing these things. And I think the, the point there is that if you deploy a 5G base station, it should also be able to run 4G in parallel. And with that, it really means that at every millisecond, it monitors the traffic in the cell and determines, oh, do I have 4G or 5G uh, kind of uh, uh, yeah, mobile phones there? And then it either transmits 4G or 5G signals, uh, depending on what, what users are, are out there. So, so why would that be of interest? Well, if uh, one of the issues is that, okay, you need to deploy new hardware, uh, should we find new sites, new location to put things up? No, nope. you can take down your 4G uh, equipment, replace it with one that can do 4G and 5G at the same time. And uh, then you are, uh, yeah, only need one piece of equipment and you are maybe starting to reuse slowly your 4G spectrum for, for 5G as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so is cognitive radio coming back then? I mean, because this dynamic spectrum sharing is um, closely connected to cognitive radio, right? They used to be like popular in in cycles or waves. I think like was it like early two thousand? Then it came back like ten years later, and then it was like almost dead for a decade, and <laughs> maybe it's now getting like hot again. Yeah, I, I suppose here it's not really about cognitive radio in the sense that someone owns the spectrum and someone else is allowed to use it if they don't interfere. But it, it's more that the one who is uh, uh, you, owning the spectrum can decide what to do with it, what radio interface to utilize. And if you read sort of the documents about how the big vendors are recommending operators to deploy 5G, it's sort of about First, deploy massive MIMO in the mid-band. Next step, uh, you might either go for millimeter wave or you might go back to your uh, 4G base stations that you have in lower bands and replace them with uh, this kind of equipment that can do both 4G and 5G. And in that way, you get 5G coverage everywhere. Then to what extent you benefit in terms of performance there for the moment, Maybe not, but um, once you have a 5G core network so you can do ultra-reliable communication and things like this, well, then this is a good way of sort of slowly push uh, people over to 5G and let 5G t- terminals get 5G services while not having to uh, remove 4G service. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I have a next question for you. Uh, it's a person who would like to know more about this research direction that we were alluding to earlier about um, sort of convergence of channel and Maxwell theories. Uh, what are the current limitations? What are the possible outcomes of, of this? And, and what does it really mean? Oh, so convergence of Maxwell and Shannon theories. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we did touch maybe that term in some previous episode Emil was it the one where we spoke with Tom Marcetta um, I think we mentioned or... it there we, we we might have mentioned it in the near far field case I'm not entirely sure but it's usually mentioned in those kind of, of situations I believe yeah you know I think this is a tough call right I mean Shannon theory and Maxwell let's say theory are, are two rather distinct and d- different well fields or theories so then mm. now what, what what I think is important here what we should do is that when we use Shannon theory they were aware of the underlying physics which is ultimately governed by Maxwell's equations right and mm. and uh, well there are certainly cases where this becomes very important like so I think one issue here is that a lot of folks in comms theory and maybe information theory, signal processing, when these communities tend to sometimes over rely on, on simplified models of the electromagnetics. And sometimes this is just fine. 
sometimes we need to be careful, right? I mean, um, mutual coupling might be the most important example to highlight here. The fact that if you have antennas in an array and you, you, and they are, they are widely separated by like at least half a wavelength or more, then well, coupling can be maybe not completely ignored, but it's a minor effect in any case. But w once the antenna spacing creeps below half a wavelength, then coupling quickly becomes the dominant physical phenomenon. And then things that we're like used to from the comms and IT papers, where we work with models where you know we get this antenna array and we say that the, the power is equal to the norm square of the signal vector. Well, that just completely breaks down, right? So we got to be very careful there. And I think in that respect, understanding Maxwell's equation and, and, and using relevant and, and accurate models for the electromagnetics is, is immensely important when we develop our, our signal processing and, and calm theoretic algorithms. No question. I mean, this is... Uh, um, yeah, and even without mutual coupling, if it wouldn't have been there, it, there is also sort of if you, you sample things, uh, oversample things over the spatial dimensions, perhaps, and then yeah, yeah, you don't yeah, get more information. I mean, but cer certainly, but but the question is when when it, the approximations that we tend to make of the physical world when we work on our signal processing algorithms, when do they become really? critically inaccurate and I think coupling is the best example of when something really breaks down I mean you put antennas closer and have a wavelength and just stop it right <laughs> unless you model the electromagnetics properly which requires more or less going back to the wave equation and really understanding what's going on there um, another example I think is polarization which is ignored in a lot of the the com theoretic also papers but in many cases I mean as long as we are in a regime where coupling is a is a minor effect and can be more or less safely ignored then polarization in the end often tends to just give you a factor of two in terms of degrees of freedom and capacity and so forth but certainly I mean you know accurate physical models are important uh, to use I think so I'm very supportive of and, and in fact I think there there is the danger here that well, we, we might be educating engineers who are extremely skilled at manipulating matrix algebra and computing Shannon theoretic capacity expressions and, and, and so forth, but you know, haven't studied Maxwell's equations <laughs> um, closely enough. And, 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 and that's something I believe as educators we should, uh, well, maybe address. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think for uh, listeners who, who really want to dig into this, which how to, to go into any type of details in a discussion like this, uh, I know there is a book on wave information theory by Fraschetti uh, that might be a first reading. This is a very nice book indeed. Uh, or, or even just, I mean, uh, re-reading the electromagnetics textbook uh, from college <laughs> could be a good idea. <laughs> yes. Uh, or, or an antenna theory book for that matter yeah um, great so did we answer the question um, <laughs> how do Shannon and Maxwell theories can converge well again I, I don't know whether it really will converge but I think the, the, the answer here is to well learn both right and then when, when using Shannon theory then be acutely aware of the underlying physics and electromagnetics which is ultimately governed by the, the Maxwell equations so yeah, yeah, and uh, if uh, each of these uh, development in each of these areas are usually uh, considering simplified assumptions regarding what is done in the other field, then there might be something there in between uh, that uh, can be modeled more in detail, and that for it will enable us to build more realistic or more advanced systems in the future. But exactly what it becomes, I think it's a bit open. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. I mean, there's also the aspect of you know, um, there is an operating regime. I mean, going, referring back to coupling, there is also an operating regime where coupling is the dominant mode of operation uh, or dominant effect that we want to exploit, right? Like, for example, in, in near field inductive power transfer. But that's not really maybe a, at least it's not a pure communication problem. So then we are more in the regime where we, 
you know, we work with Maxwell's equations and then, well, it's possibly we build this inductive coupling link that we can also transfer some information and then we might need a little bit of Shannon theory <laughs> to, yeah. for, for that to be useful. So, uh, yeah. Um, all right. Great. So maybe we should move on in the list. I think question number nine here is for you, Emil. Uh, will side link or device to device communication become a uh, major component in future wireless systems? Hmm. And then the question is also maybe it already is. Uh, so uh, if we consider then device to device communication, it's really about two sort of user devices in some sense that are communicating directly with each other with no base station or access point or anything this uh, in between and uh, uh, because yeah they're in close proximity to each other and we are using this with bluetooth all the time between two devices uh, and uh, there is also the wi-fi direct where you sort of use Wi-Fi between two devices so whenever I'm on the train and I connect my phone to my laptop to get internet access then it's a Wi-Fi direct I suppose that is utilized there uh, yeah I, I believe here the question is really about using license spectrum for uh, the things that is, you have in, in 5G for example and, mm. and there there were uh, yeah, 10 years ago a lot of research around device to device communications and uh, the idea that well if two devices are close to each other and uh, instead of communicating via the base station in two hops it will be more efficient if they can just communicate directly with each other mm. uh, the problem is then of course that you want the network to control this Otherwise, the entire point of having license spectrum becomes destroyed because you're not controlling the interference uh, and uh, latencies and everything in the network. Uh, you can definitely do that. What would be the reason to not use Wi-Fi Direct? Well, once again, latency, you can guarantee something around rates and things like that. So so when will that be, be used? Uh, I think uh, when people were doing research in the beginning on device to device, they talked about, oh, there will be some kind of um, uh, entertainment systems so or things like that. Uh, maybe in those cases, Wi-Fi Direct works well. I think right now the core use case might be connected vehicles or connected robots or things like this. Mm. So when ultra-reliable communication will hopefully be a thing in the coming years, then having vehicles directly talk to each other under the control of a cell tower, uh, that might be a big thing. So, so side link for connected vehicles, connected robots and things like that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and where latency is a major issue as well, right? But and maybe it's harder to see. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it might be harder to see like why cell phones or smartphones would communicate in device to device mode <laughs> to one another when, when you're out on the street I mean so yeah um, mm. uh, but yeah there are some emerging use cases uh, where latency is the big thing uh, and uh, in those cases it, it, it's still on the table it's not a, the technology so uh, yeah it, it might be, be a big thing five years from now mm -hmm. okay I have a last question for you uh, will full duplex radios be adopted in wireless communication? Full duplex, wow. Okay, so so full duplex means a transceiver that can the same frequency band receive and, and transmit simultaneously, right? So mm -hmm. if you have like an antenna connected to some circuitry, then one way of at least of building a full duplex transceiver is to have a circulator then that isolates the outbound wave from the, the inbound wave and, and separates them like into two different branches in the in the circuitry. Mm. Um, so I mean theoretically you could argue that I mean if you if you can transmit and receive at the same time then you could gain like a factor of two in, in capacity, right? Mm. Which I think is only part of the truth because number one we need to think carefully about how we define power constraints here. If we, if we take turns, like in time division duplexing, then is the peak is the power constraint on the peak or is it on the average and so forth? And also we need to think mm. carefully about what happens to interference and all that. So in the end, it might not be this factor of two. But one could think of like other gains that full duplex brings with it. For example, if you were able to measure uplink pilots simultaneously as you do your downlink transmission with a, with a MIMO array, then you could gain in 
in, in latency between the point where you estimate your channels and the point where you use them for the beam forming, right? So you could kind of get mm-hmm. around the, the the channel aging problem in, in a very neat way. So so in general, I, I find full duplex extremely fascinating as a technology. And I think this use case where, you know, measuring channel state information at the same time as you're using it for, for downlink beam forming a transmission, that, that's to me, that's the most convincing use case. Then, whether we'll see this or when we'll see it is difficult to predict. I mean, um, I would not be surprised if one day we'll have it uh, implemented in wireless access points, probably for that purpose that I mentioned. I mean, to get channel state information in like air quotes real time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. W- w- what do you think, Emil? I think for this thing we talked about earlier with uh, localization and sensing, mm. this could be uh, useful as well because then you transmit and, and you can also listen back on the radar signals. So yeah, like a monostatic. Um, yeah, uh, becomes monostatic and not then. bistatic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I think one can definitely build this all, already and uh, it might be closer to put it on the base stations then have it in the user device because if it it requires a lot of extra hardware components maybe we don't want it in a compact user device uh, mm. so i've seen a lot of work also considering like a full duplex base station and then users that are uh, using either uplink or downlink um, mm. and yeah we can handle more traffic i suppose mm. yeah hmm? yeah wow okay great so i think These were all the 10 questions. (laughs) Yeah, thank you very much to all the listeners for for asking them. I hope uh, they feel that we have actually answered it uh, relatively well, at least. And yeah, please continue asking questions uh, uh, when we are putting out videos and we we try to respond to them either in episodes or in YouTube comments. Uh, I think YouTube is the best place to to ask questions on particular videos. Absolutely. And don't forget to log into YouTube and like and subscribe us there. So then thank you very much. Thank you and happy new year. Bye. Bye bye.